so for trivia, the question was um, something along the lines of, in this in this photo, uh, the gentleman on the left, who is the guy who wasn't in make costume and it wasn't the dummy, it was the gentleman on the left. Uh, he had a reputation for a specific way of acting, so much so that in the business he gained a nickname. What was that nickname? Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess my question, because it looked very British, uh, was it a British uh, actor? I I didn't get a chance to look him up. I, I got we gotta go back through the things. But my notes for Pee Wee uh, Herman's uh, Big Adventure did work out, kind of. I did actually flub a couple, but that was just my fault because I had missed uh, understood the question a bit and I got a little too excited. But that <laughs> said, uh, my extensive eight pages of notes on Pee Wee's big event. There's a lot of stuff in the background. Hello, everyone. We're live, by the way, and I'm just recovering from the world's largest trivia contest, Trivia 54 from uh, Stevens Point. And uh, so... Uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll, we'll get to the episode in a minute, but I took so many notes on that, but it was so difficult because if you're familiar with Pee Wee's Big Adventure at all, uh, there is so much stuff in the background. It is it is insane. It is, it is highly in insane. And then and then the stuff, it just it goes from there because with trivia, they could ask the license plate on a car they could ask the make and model of this. They could ask something that was completely not in the movie, but they start you at the movie. Um, but the rest of my notes luckily have helped the team get answers. But uh, one of the things I did notice is they reused a license plate. There was a license plate number that was exactly the same. A prop must have been a prop license plate number. Pee Wee is waving goodbye to uh, the waitress that he uh, met. Simone, uh, and he's waving goodbye, and then there's a license plate, which I think was something along the lines of, like, uh, NX1030, and then he's being chased by Simone's boyfriend. He gets into the trailer park before he turns into the, he puts the rodeo costume on. Just before that, he passes by a trailer. There's a license plate there. It's the exact same number as what was on the back of the bus. <laughs> Now, they didn't oh, ask that no. question, but when you take notes for trivia, you start noticing all these things, right? Just like there's a book way in the back I could not find at all in Pee Wee's bedroom, which was looked like it was from Toys R Us, and it was like Jeffrey's, I think, book of bicycle safety or Jeffrey's guide to bicycle safety from Toys R Us, and I couldn't find it anywhere online and everything else in the room is stuff from the real world like 50s toys and 60s toys but that one thing wasn't there so even though it had nothing to do with trivia i was searching for it for a while going where the hell is this book i need to find this book <laughs> but that's, that's amazing it's kind of like the uh the, the meme of ed o'neill reading the newspaper on uh, married with children and then on modern family and you see that the front of the newspaper is exactly the same i think i i saw uh uh props in his uh props to history uh there's a guy on tiktok or whatever who is a historian on movie props and he people will send in and talk about props and movies they see and the guy has all this information and that newspaper apparently is the most used it's the same one that was used in back to the future and apparently that same newspaper has been used in what they guesstimate almost sixteen thousand movies at some point it is a generic newspaper prop that is printed out or used that same one with the same articles constantly and the only thing they change occasionally is maybe the front of it but the rest of it is the exact same <laughs> Speaking of newspapers, my roommate noted uh, uh, he bought the new Looney Tunes um, uh, Warner Archive uh, set. Oh, nice. uh, spotlight volume. No, not Spotlight. It's a uh, uh, you know Collector's Choice Volume Three. And he want yeah. he specifically he wanted to watch the Mouse on Fifty Seventh Street. And he and we're watching it now, and it's cleared up for Blu-ray, and sure. it's, up, it's up on the big screen. He's like, wait a second. 
he goes back and he pauses on the newspapers and he's reading like you know the headlines or yeah. you know whatever's going on with the with the mouse who got drunk and like stole mm -hmm. a diamond but underneath is all copy from like Warner Brothers trade papers <laughs> it's like stuff like, about like I'm like whoa <laughs> That is so cool. That that's what they were using as the as the teletype because you know these this came out in the fifties. It was playing yeah. in theaters. You're not going to pause it and look. No, no. So but... yeah, what did it matter? <laughs> but now on the Blu-ray, he just went back and paused it. Clear as day. It's just stuff from the trades about Warner Brothers. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's why. Uh, and we'll get. I'm not trying to avoid talking about this movie, but I I might be be avoiding but i'm not i'm just decompressing <laughs> from 54 hours of trivia which i played uh 47 of i got seven hours of sleep in uh the three days before sunday night midnight uh so yeah uh you sleep huh you sleep you have to if you want to be functional and useful to people. You got to get at least a, a short nap of. I, I don't know, man. Every time I open up YouTube, there's another review or interview or something <laughs> that you're doing, and I'm like, where does this guy find the time? I was a little slow. I've been a little slow. I've been slowing up a little, but I got a whole bunch that I'm going to be dropping in the next two weeks. But what we're going to drop tonight is some tea. See, I'm <laughs> hip with the kids now. We're gonna... from like ten years ago. Yes, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I, hey, it's newer than, than most things that I say, but what is not so new is the movie we're talking about tonight, but it is newer than the film it's based upon. Yes, folks, thank you for venturing down the stairs and pulling up the chair and grabbing your favorite drink with us as we talk spoilers in the spoiler room. I have a wonderful crew to dance the conga line with me again as we look at another King Kong film. What's what we're doing all month, and we're looking at King Kong. From 2005, King Kong from Peter Jackson coming off of what I think was just coming off as Lord of the Rings run. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, picture. huh? Just coming off a of best picture and just coming off a of best picture. So, you know, that's one thing about the Oscars is they seem to curse anybody who wins best of suddenly the next project they get. Is not exactly the best? <laughs> Ali Berry, J.B. Fox. I mean, you know, we, we, could, we could drop a list. I don't think Cuba Gooding Jr. has done anything good since he won. No, he has <laughs> not, a, not, a, not a lot. Well, he, he, he dramatically bit into his pipe in Red Wings, but that was... Uh, <laughs> hey, you guys are leaving out Kevin Spacey, uh, Usual Suspects <laughs> to American Beauty, and uh And, and, and then... <laughs> and, then, and then accusations. So tonight, enough about them. We're talking about King Kong 2005. My crew with me tonight. First off, Mr. Joe Randazzo is with us. How you doing tonight, Joe? Hey, everyone. Doing great. Glad to have you here. And then the man who keeps coming back for more, none other than Mr. Ian Simmons. How you doing, Ian? <laughs> doing great. <laughs> it, it, it's that's this isn't silent pictures the, the podcast folks aren't going to know what you're doing but that's okay well, they could hear they could hear the the sound of my fist beating against my chest and if not they heard me describe the fact that i was beating my fist against my chest well there you go see yeah <laughs> it's so, all about yeah. the old-timey radio here on the podcast all, yeah old-timey radio old-timey <laughs> is exactly what peter jackson tried for in King Kong 2005, and Joe, you're you you become our synopsis guy, but I know you are sans a box. But could you? <laughs> well, could I you... have one, but there's no description of the movie on the back. It's just the credits. The, uh, yeah, it's just the credits. Yeah, see, I've got that same one. That three. <laughs> from, <laughs> yeah, from I found it a Dollar Tree, like a, like a fucking year a ago. quarter quarter tree. Yeah, this is this is what I where I got mine from. It's um, it's King got that wonderful King Kong versus Godzilla, which we do at the end of the month, and King Kong Escapes, which we'll be doing next week. So, you know, hey, I don't realize I, you're doing I got King a question. Kong Escapes next week. Maybe, maybe I'll join you for that one. Was it well, real quick? It's got the Peter Jackson King Kong on there. Does it have all the extras that I assume no. are on the regular no. disc? No, it's, it's just, just, a, it's a, just movie. a movie. That's it. Nothing it's else. Just okay. a movie. Mm. It's, they, they, it's, what, it's what, the theatrical cut, not the extra 15 minute cut of king kong so there there is a three hour and 20 minute this is a three hour and eight minute version oh boy uh, 
<laughs> and with that lead in, go, Joe. <laughs> I mean, so, uh, can we just cut and paste the synopsis from last week? <laughs> you could. You could. Go the, for the, it. The, only, the only difference is Carl Denham is much more of a dick in this version. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, early 1930s New York, uh, middle of the Depression. Uh, this time, Andero isn't a um, street urchin. Or isn't a yeah. street urchin, yeah. She's actually an actress who's part of a production that is uh, at a theater that just gets shut down right at the beginning. Um, we still get the meat cute of, uh, of her um, her uh, stealing uh, stealing fruit and uh, Carl Denham popping up with a dime this time. He cheaped out from the 1933 version. <laughs> he gave a dollar last time or something. <laughs> yeah, it was 20 bucks last time. Well, no, no, it was a dollar. It was a dollar, which we said would equal to 20 bucks. That's yeah, true, yeah. Um, so he's got a little cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> um what else is there different in this open uh uh jack driscoll's not just a random guy on the ship now he's an author and a screenwriter Faye ray exists yeah as herself in this universe in a full <laughs> meta reference Faye yeah he's and and he get, Nick. yeah yeah he can't get Faye ray for this movie <laughs> Uh, what else was different this time around? Uh, it was in color. No, well, that too. <laughs> that too. There, there's, there's a lot different. But as far as the story, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, the story is basically um, the same. It, um, the first hour is still basically them getting to the island. Yeah. Um, it's, it's like, it's like if you go to McDonald's and you buy a hamburger. OK, or like just a, like buck something hamburger and then you buy a double quarter pounder with cheese. It's the same meat. There's just a lot more of the same with the double quarter. And that's what Peter Jackson's King Kong is. There's a lot <laughs> more of the double quarter than you get with the hamburger. The onions are bigger. You get more cheese and more ketchup. But at its core, it's just more of the same <laughs> yeah and, and it's shoved all in the middle it's shoved all because like the first act and like the end or well the end there's a lot of changes but yeah but, we'll, we'll get to we'll, we'll get, get to, to those that for sure but uh yeah uh and we'll, we'll, we'll kick it to ian first ian uh, how, you literally just finished it before the podcast I, <laughs> it's eating this in small morsels i may be going with a food metaphors tonight i don't know uh i'm a little Whew. So, uh, but he had worked up an appetite with that trivia, huh? I did work, work up an appetite with trivia, <laughs> and, and, uh, and you satiated it with. I missed the pre-show, but I assume you talked about the Twinkie Wiener dog. No, we did not. We I, did I, not. I showed up late. How? So. How? how? We, he showed. We didn't even do a real pre-show uh, yet. I'm doing something else possible for my patrons there, but yes, okay. Uh, just to take a break before King Kong, we. We realized our age in trivia for our team. We used to like shotgun beers at the end of trivia and enjoy some brewskis, you know, uh, some brews. And then we'd also during trivia occasionally would drink Jones's sodas, those flavored sodas. So you'd have like the Thanksgiving dinner, which would have pea flavored soda, like green peas, a uh, flavored okay. soda and stuffing soda and turkey soda and they'd be these meals but they stopped making those after a while and so it, m then uh my buddy uh, mark he would eat pork brains or bring a can of pork brains to eat which is a thousand thirty four percent of your daily allowance of cholesterol by the way um and we would eat some of that but it smelled and it just our our systems just can't handle that anymore so we wanted a new tradition so yes in honor of Weird Al, because we got a number of UHF questions over the course of the contest, we decided, let's try making a Twinkie Wiener sandwich. And so we did. And you know what? It's not phenomenal by any means, but it's not bad. Uh, we went with the regular uh, cheese whiz. We're thinking next year we might go with like the smoked cheddar or like real cheddar because we didn't do real cheddar cheese whiz. We just did the regular processed cheese whiz. So there wasn't a whole lot of flavor there, but the, the variety of textures that come in when you eat the Twinkie Wiener sandwich is just very interesting. 
Uh, and it makes it very rich too, by the way. It drops in your stomach and you're good for like a day, I think. Well, I can imagine. I, I, I can. The only way I could think to improve it would be to go to like a carnival and get a fried Twinkie for your Twinkie Wiener sandwich. Oh, well, we, 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 did debate, we did debate on whether or not we should heat the hot dog or not, but we're like, no, that's going to probably, you know, because then the frosting in the middle of the Twinkie would melt and it would kind of change maybe the flavoring. So we went with cold hot dogs and the cold hot dogs works just fine. So, but next year we're going to maybe mix up the cheese a little bit. Uh, but it's got to be cheese whiz. It's got to come from a can. So yeah, I'm I'm with you, Joe. I the idea of eating a cold hot dog is uh, no. That's too. Well, close I mean, it's point. not even on the like disgusting level. It's can you actually or wouldn't that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You could eat a raw, hot, eat raw dog. hot dogs. On. Yeah, hot dogs. Hot dogs are already filled with pre cooked stuff. You can eat them raw. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, it's just like a, I would not have... advise it. Uh, I I no. wouldn't try it. <laughs> it's just like the 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 pet prepackaged johnsonville brats that aren't like uh like in the bigger packages they come in the packages where you got the zip they're pre-cooked that's i mean hot dogs are the same way yeah i uh, used to buy the chicken ones of those uh the, mm -hmm. the little chicken strips of those uh johnson's pre-cooked things and then i just heat them up because if you're like one quick when you're, a quick meal you know. yeah when you when you're like in a pinch and you got to do something fast that uh, that's not bad because they heat up in minutes so um, in case you haven't guessed, folks, we love Peter Jackson's campaign. <laughs> uh, well, you brought up the Twinkie. 15 reader. minutes yeah. in. And we've just we are 15 minutes in and we managed to get through the synopsis and mentioned how it's in. Okay, so, Ian, how'd you feel about it? I can't believe this movie is almost 20 years old, first of all. Uh, yeah. Second of all, yeah. I watched this movie, just to put it into context of where I was at, I had not seen Dead Alive when I saw this. Mm -hmm. um, I had seen the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and I hated it. Mm. Uh, so when I got dragged to see King Kong, I was like, this looks terrible. It's three hours long. I was so bored, and I walked out pretty much like hating every second of it. Flash forward, you know, almost two decades. I've seen and loved Peter Jackson's Dead Alive. Uh, I've grown to appreciate the Lord of the Rings trilogy very much so, and I'm you know even reading the books. Um, and uh, now I've recently watched the original King Kong. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm much softer on Jackson's King Kong now than I was certainly you know 24 hours ago. Um, it's not perfect. I found a lot of it to be annoying. Um, I, I kind of got backed into that mental corner of like who is this made for because i feel like if you've never seen king kong before you know maybe it's fine but if you have seen king kong i think a lot of the changes a lot of the extra stuff as i as i mentioned to you mark as i was struggling throughout this crazy hectic day that began at 3 45 in the morning and it's still not let up uh i was trying to squeeze in watching this movie throughout you know yeah. the million things i had going on and i was like why why is this twice as long as the original film? Uh, some of it works, some of it doesn't. But uh, yeah, it's kind of like that Patton Oswalt joke about the Star Wars prequels. Yeah, like, you know, oh, it, we're gonna it's a it's a story about Darth Vader, and we're gonna meet him as a little kid. I'm like you don't really need to know any of that. I I don't need to see uh, Naomi Watts as uh, Anne Darrow as a struggling vaudevillian performer who almost becomes a stripper uh it's fine if we just pick up at the uh at the grocery stand that stuff is handled very well i like the dinner scene afterwards i like the recreations of all the original kong stuff it uh it's just the the rest of it with some exceptions feels kind of superfluous this could have been a neat and tidy hour 45 two hour movie but there's so much extra stuff piled on as you guys mentioned yeah what about you joe how you feel on this one i'm mostly the same the same on this i i definitely did i did not need this movie to be three hours and because like like mark i had a lot of stuff going on today where i keep getting uh phone calls and texts interrupting me it took me like five hours to get through it because i had to keep pausing it to like respond to like real life stuff so um 
but I don't. There were there were a couple times I think I messaged you guys. I was like, and Taro should have been dead like ten times before they even leave the island because he's just holding her in her head as he's like punching oh. his tracks and he's rolling over. I'm like, wait, wouldn't him rolling over crush her to death? <laughs> well, also when he's picking her, this is it's weird because if you look at the 1933 version, even though it was probably a a, a clay dummy that was in the hands for all the sh the faraway shots with Kong like picking up Andero, the body still moved more realistically than it did in the 2005 when you still had that kind of new millennium rubber effect because yeah. as I mentioned, Andero would have been complete bloody jelly by the time they even got off the island because she's being like shaken around. Forget about like rolling around. I'm talking like just when Kong it, first kidnaps her and starts shaking her around like a rag doll, that would have snapped well, her neck yeah. instantly. Well, yeah, he's he's he. <laughs> yeah, it, it, we're going to jump around, folks. But yeah, after Kong gets Andero from we'll get we'll get to the tribe that's on this island in a minute. The the Dollar Tree Uruquai. Uh, guys, uh, or what? Uh, Urukai, uh, not Urukai. <laughs> thank you. Uh, those Dollar Tree. If I were saying the Iroquois, I'm like, no, no, wait, no, 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 back, no, back off from no, that ledge. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. The, the, these are like these are like the the D team from Lord of the Rings that were leftovers. But we'll we'll talk about that. But you're right. He gets he he kidnaps Andero, and rather than you would think that he would be running with you know, his feet and the one arm and like cradle her as he's running. But no, he has her in the arm and he's doing the knuckle uh, charge. And then when he gets to this ledge, he, I don't know if he mistook her for a uh, Bic lighter that was running out of uh, <laughs> fuel because he literally looks at her and then he's like, uh, 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 and then he looks at her again. I'm like, Dude, she she's not a big lighter. Why are you doing that? And then I'm like, she should have been dead three times at this point, just from the way you were holding her when you were walking. Yeah, that, that's that's what I was. It's like, what is going on with this? And then on top of that, when, when uh, Adrian Brody saves her, uh, and he's hanging off that ledge on that vine, she leaps over onto his back, and like she's got a lot more faith in Adrian <laughs> Brody's vine than than I would. <laughs> Well, never mind that vine was no, if you look below them, I don't know where the frack they were going to go because that <laughs> vine was not long enough to go all the way down to the jungle bottom from that ledge. <laughs> I, I don't there, think you can see the jungle bottom. No. I, I there, think they were just going to hang there and wait until Kong like lost interest or went away. I think that was the idea. Maybe. Though I did but, like the fact he used one of the bats then to glide down uh with a you know to, i i liked that bit i was like okay that was pretty cool that he he used that you know but still it was like what is this <laughs> you definitely have to throw out any notions of realism which is kind of unfortunate because i think the original king kong even though it's you know stop motion puppetry uh still kind of holds up in that the filmmakers were i think doing the hard work of trying to make you believe here it's just everything is rubber uh at, at the climactic famous scene on the empire state building um when ann darrow she's on that ladder and it starts to fall back and she's dangling over the city first with two hands and then there, we cut to a short a shot from below and she's hanging on by one hand i'm like there's absolutely no way <laughs> <laughs> there are planes buzzing around you a giant ape this wobbly ladder your grip is not you know you're not superman for crying out loud well i mean you bring up a good point and it's something I didn't notice when I first watched it many years ago, and I didn't quite care for it because I I loved the original, and I was it was one of those to where, what was the real point of this one? There's parts of this film I do enjoy quite a bit, but part yeah. of it, let's just say, don't watch it after you've been up 47 hours over the weekend, uh, because my wife said, okay, that one time sounded like a snort of laugh, but that second time you were snoring. And I'm like, I was not. And she's like, no, you were. I'm like, okay, honey. Uh, I, I Just for a brief minute. But, uh, you know, there's some really bad edits in this movie. There's one where you were watching to where it's like, I think it was like the first time she was, she was where she was entertaining Kong or something. It was like 
one angle she looked one way and her hair was like we literally cut to a reverse angle of her she looks completely different like it there's something that happened in there between those cuts that they just removed and it, it's supposed to be the same look but it doesn't look it, it, and there's a few other jump edits. I was gonna say there were a few other instances where something like that happened too. So, and you're just like, ah, ah, what? <laughs> I, I'm trying to figure out why Peter Jackson decided that this needed to become an affair to remember. <laughs> like, yeah. with, the, with the scene of the two of them meeting up, <laughs> and he sees her coming, and he just feels that it's her. <laughs> why? Yeah, why did that... first, I guess. I... Physically, that I will know. never work. By the way, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yeah. Well, that's that's what I got, and and the the way they film Naomi Watts in here. I mean, no no slight to her. I mean, they've got talent in this movie. No slight to her, but it was like I was having I was having Willow flashbacks. You know, whenever they would just cut to the baby, just staring at the camera, the baby. There are so many scenes in here where they have Naomi Watts just staring at the camera like this for longer than needs to, and too many shots. Of that. I'm like, we we get it. He's well, so I mean, that's like that's Peter well. Jackson. He was doing the same shit in Lord of the Rings. I mean, well, it yeah. was a, it's a drinking game that entire trilogy. Every time someone does this. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but I mean, I I liked the change up with the the captains. You know, I, I the meta nods were kind of fun. Uh, the fact that we have um, Jack Black's character uh, Driscoll, uh, Dunno, he's filming a scene that has dialogue from the original King Kong that we talked about actually on the last episode, the dialogue between Andero and the captain. But in the 1933, the captain was the love interest for Andero. Uh, and, and in this one, no man is uh, the interest. <laughs> well, a little bit. The, the, the there is a love interest. It's not a human. <laughs> it's not a human. I mean, Adrian Bo Brody is like the side piece, really. The, the the playwright, you know. She's like, well, I can't really. I mean, Kong can't physically happen, so I guess I'll settle for the, the, the geeky playwright. But they do a scene where they have the Captain and, and, and Andero dialogue that's exactly from the movie, you know, his nod to the original. So I kind of liked that they were filming the 1933 Kong that you saw in 1930. You know what I'm saying? I I, I like yeah. that. At least it was something a little different for your remake. I'm like, okay, that, that nod is kind of nice, but then they get to the Island and uh, yeah. See, I, you know, I, I, I get it. It's something that, you know, it is a choice. It's a choice that Peter Jackson and the screenwriters made. I didn't appreciate that. Yeah. Um, partially because, um, you know, I think the, the actor who played the, the captain, um, I would have liked to have seen him be the lead in this movie besides Adrian, yeah. you know, instead of Adrian Brody. Um, you can still do a lot there. I, uh, some of the additional characters like, you know, Jamie Bell, I thought was, was really good in his relationship with the, uh, I guess the first mate the first that was kind game, of yeah. some, some, yeah, some, some touching stuff. And, you know, I, I, I almost would have rather, you know, they get separated from the rest of the group and they have to fight their way off of Skull Island. And at the end, they just catch up with everybody on their way back to New York. I would have if that had been the entire movie, I would have been very happy. Um, I, I'm glad that we got the the nest scene with the spiders and the creepy crawlies. I think that was the most exciting part of all of the uh, the island stuff. Um, but yeah, like I go back and my question, like, who is this for? Like, I don't know if diehard Kong fans, and it sounds like it kind of worked on you guys, but like, are they going to appreciate these cheap tricks of like, up? Oh, it's not this guy. It's a guy pretending to be this guy and they're filming this meta narrative. It's just, it's too cute by half instead of just, let's just get down to it. Remake the movie. It was, you know, 70 or 60 years. I can't do math uh, at the point that he made this. So it's like, yeah, it was just, been 70, it's a straight remake. 72 at that point. Yeah. About 72 years old. 
So. Right. I, I would say just remake King Kong with modern technology, add back like the spider scene, maybe a couple of other flourishes. Like I think I really liked the rampage in the theater at the end. I thought that yes. was really effective. Yeah. Um, and it's just, yeah, just bring some modern sensibilities and, you know, some of the innovations of the ensuing seven decades to the story, but leave the story intact. Because most people who went to see this movie, I would wager, had not bothered to watch King Kong because, you know, it was right. black and white, frankly. Uh, I, I, did we need the the uh, the ice skating scene <laughs> you know, or, or they're on the uh, they're on the uh, rink in Central Park? Like, uh, no, but I'm going to defend the ice rink scene. Um, because I, you guys seem to have this weird thing like it would never work out between Kong and Anne. I, it was never supposed to work <laughs> out between no. Kong and Anne Darrow. It's just like Elliot did I, not want to fuck ET. They just no, they had I, a bond. They formed a bond, and you know they they grew to appreciate each other on on this kind of like a deeper level. And the world wanted to tear them apart because of you know Kong was different. And I, I really appreciate that. And I liked. There, there's a fun kind of lyricism to that scene on the ice. I still don't know if it works because I it, that that ice had to have been very, very strong. See, I was telling my wife long. that I'm like that pond had to be that had to be solid, like frozen to the bottom, but it's not because they have the artillery that comes in that breaks the ice that you know he starts to slip. Because I'm just thinking of physics wise, and I'm just like that 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 that's not gonna work like that. <laughs> you know, it was just like just uh, uh, where was he he was walking somewhere else to oh he's hopping along on the roof of the buildings you know kind of a la spider-man as he's trying to get away from them and i'm just like new york's got some strong buildings then because holy okay he's... okay mark hold on a second yeah this movie is better than any of the legendary films by a country mile so I you cannot you you cannot give me any nonsense about the physics of 2005 king kong and at the same breath no. say that in any way defend the legendary but, but, pictures. but that goes but that goes to what you were saying of who this movie's for i'm fine to let that go if you aren't playing this series, but the tonal shifts and the tonal roller coaster you go on in this film of going from what feels like a satirical performance by Jack Black in Hollywood to then we get to the island and it's supposed to be more serious because dude literally gets run through with a spear. They smash the head of another one a la Keegan. It suddenly just gets this really dark. And then we kind of go into adventure romance land and then you know and, and so i was trying to figure out okay if you're gonna go kind of satirical that's fine because you've got jack black but not everybody is playing their roles the same way and so i, I guess for, I, I disagree i think I, I think tonally the movie is is solid throughout now it does it does evolve depending on who we're following because we do the movie splits off. But I mean, I think Jack yeah. Black is a pretty consistent character because when we first meet him, he is sort of Jack Black E, but we also see that he is a guy in trouble. And a lot of that persona is his front, his showmanship, because he desperately wants to make these movies. And when he gets to Skull Island and he realizes how much danger he's in, but also how much opportunity there is, this is a guy with literally nothing left to lose. And we come to find out that he will sacrifice not only his own life if necessary, but the lives of every this guy would have been a junior executive at Wayland Utani 300 years in the future. And I think that's that's one of the things I appreciate about watching him this time. It, yeah, no, I get that. I just for him, I think he was miscast, though. I I do not like his performance in this. Every time I see him, it it, it I literally lose investment uh, there's only certain parts there's there's a few parts but when he's being his guy in hollywood the whole time i i just can't but he's not but he's not when when he as he goes through the experience on the island i mean he's he's turning into martin sheen in apocalypse now because he goes like at the end when they're about to uh when and darrow and uh, I keep calling Adrian Brody because uh, yeah. I, I refuse to call him Jack Driscoll because he's fucking not. <laughs> but when they make their way out of the jungle onto the scene, they're, they're coming across the bridge yes. and they encounter the group 
getting ready to chloroform and trap King Kong. She passes by him and she gives him this look and it's captured beautifully in slow motion that says, this is not the same guy that I was separated from two days ago. This guy I, has gone completely around the bend. I get that. And that's the one scene that I enjoy his character in. And I enjoy his character in a couple other scenes. But for the majority of the three hour movie, I do not care for Jack Black's performance in this. I think it comes off too Jack Blackish for me, for me to take the character seriously until you get to that part near the end. And I understand they may be playing an arc, but I gave two shits about his character for, I, if he would have died even earlier in the film, I would not have cared at all because I, it, it did not come off as a genuine character. I, for I, I, I don't Go know ahead. what more you want from this character. The only I, critique I have is the way the film ended because I don't think he sells that line of it was no, beauty killed the beast. Doesn't. And I also, because they developed the denim character more in this film, I think he should have been, you know, pilloried or more guilt stricken or punished in some way. Um, get away with that a little bit more in Kong 33 because he's less important to the movie. But when you shine that spotlight on him, you got to do a little bit more. Well, here I felt he was a complete sociopath. <clears throat> you know, uh, we'll uh, we'll set you know we'll we'll send the proceeds to his widow. Yeah, he kept <laughs> saying that. Yeah, yeah, he says that like multiple times in this movie when, <laughs> when one of his crewmen gets killed, and it's the kind of thing that I I, I, I get Mar I get what Mark's. It's kind of a caricature of that old Hollywood style of oh, if uh, somebody has to die to get it, they'll be immortalized forever, which he also says in this movie. I think he does. Yeah, right. he does. I, yeah, he does. Well, say that, that's. Well, that's and that's the that's uh, on the fall of the screenplay, because if I if I'm right about this, he only says that bit twice. Mm -hmm. And for a good old screenplay, you need the old rule of three. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it is a bit off kilter. I, I mean, yeah, that's that's the thing is he does use that line twice. But on the second time, if you'll notice, Colin Hanks's reaction to him is, yeah, I was there when you lose use that line the first time. Right. Are you OK? So. I, you know, I'm not asking you to go watch the movie again, but I'm saying if you were to like really pay attention to what's going on with the with the Carl Denham character in here, because it's pretty much note perfect up until that last scene. Yeah, I I've this is my third or fourth time watching it. And Jack Black for me just doesn't work for whatever reason. It just comes off as too disingenuine for most of the film you get a certain few parts where he's playing it serious where I, I start to get into it, but it just, you know, the last, the last half hour when we get, or of his scenes, I get more though. He does not stick the end line uh, very well, but I guess, and I, I, I'm doing it because it is a remake. So I'm just going to say the way that the guy comes off in the 1933 version of being the director felt a bit more genuine than what the what jack i liked his i liked his uh him talking to and uh and daryl in the cafe and the part you know with him um with him and, and the whole dollars you know the the apple scene i like that scene i i think it was the uh just the some of the in-between scene getting to certain points in the film i just it took it it took me away from his character. I didn't really <laughs> give a rip. You know, I was back in and out with his character, I, I guess. I didn't really stick with him all the way through. I wanted to see more of the captain, in all honesty. I loved the captain character quite a bit. Uh, I liked some of the people around him, uh, you know, around Jack Black. Uh, I just, I don't know what it is. Maybe it was because I, uh, before I had seen King Kong, I had only seen him in comedies. So every time he was maybe playing it up to be the caricature, it felt like a Jack Black character. And a lot of those didn't hit with me. So maybe it was subconscious from his other films mm -hmm. seeping in that I just couldn't get away from it because some of his his, you know, style seeped into this character. <laughs> so I guess maybe that's it. I don't know. I just for me, the Carl Denham character really just up until maybe the last uh, you know, when they're actually trying to capture Kong uh, that I kind of got behind his character, or at least it, it liked his character a little more than before then. 
Well, the other thing about Carl Denham in this movie is he's a completely different character than he was in 33 because of the age. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure the age of the actor in 33. Now, because it was 1933, he could have been the same age, Jack Black. Everybody looked the same just... age, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, but it's, he he looked like he was playing an older, more experienced filmmaker. Not a right. particularly good one, but Jack Black in 2005 was in his early 30s, right. and it shows. Um, he's a much he's more of a the hungry young you know Hollywood like upstart than the the version we get in 1933. Honestly, I think his performance or his cutoff in 2005 should have been that last shot we get after Kong is stormed out of the theater and he's just standing there on stage like mm -hmm. looking ruined. I think if that's if we had never gone back to his character, then that would have been better. Certainly than that that stinger that, that closed the movie. Yikes. And they, and and that could be part of it too. Sorry, Joe didn't mean, but I just, yeah. I, 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 how did I you? I was looking up uh, Robert Armstrong. Uh, yeah, Jack Black was in his early thirties. <clears throat> Robert Armstrong, who played Carl Dunham in the original, was in his uh, mid forties. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah there was there it. was a little bit of a difference in age. Yeah. You know, and I guess just for me, Joe, I guess you can weigh in. How do you feel with Jack Black's casting in this? Um, I did. I didn't have a strong opinion on Jack Black one one way or the other in here. I just mm -hmm. felt like the character was written to be more of a sociopath, mm -hmm. and I don't I don't know if that's Jack Black bringing that to him. Um, I could see I. I could definitely see both sides of you guys uh, having this uh, this little disagreement about it because I could definitely see he's way more fleshed out here mm -hmm. than he was in the 33 version. But at the same time, I could see why you would say he's he's kind of a caricature because it, it seems like he maybe he was being played up more for laughs at times. Like maybe he was meant to be some kind of comic relief and maybe that's that's where you're having an issue with it. And I don't know, again, if that's Jack Black's delivery or if that was the um, – that was the intention of the screenplay. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I didn't feel one way or another about him, except for the fact that the character is very much a complete and total asshole. In this he movie. is. Yeah. Not, yeah. Not so much in the original In the original. He really seemed like he was like, you know, this guy who, who, who you know, actually legitimately wants to make something right. good with, with, with Jack black. It's, it's, it's like you guys said earlier, I don't care if everybody has to die for me to get this film right. made the way I want it. I will sacrifice everybody on that ship. And that's, I, I think that's a huge difference in, in how the character works out. And, and maybe that's it. And, and it is getting the emotional feeling that I'm supposed to be getting from his character and that I don't like him. It's not just because it's Jack Black, but it, it also the nuances of Jack Black. I mean, Jack Black's always been a hard sell for me to begin with i like his tenacious d stuff when we get into his acting roles there's some roles that i've liked him in and many of his movies just did not land for me so you know I, again maybe subconsciously it's bringing it into it and yeah he's not supposed to be a, be a likable character you know in this and and then we go to uh andaro you know our, our andaro character I'm with you guys. I did. They could have cut out that backstory part and just cut right to her stealing the app. There was real because it's covered in dialogue. You know, I mean, it's covered in one line. They cover the exact stuff in the cafe where they don't need, I think, the lead up to it. I think it, it means more if she wasn't really i mean because in the first one she wasn't really an established actress at all she had no. no experience ever performing and here she has experience performing but she's down and out on like you know off 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 vaudeville <laughs> and you know maybe they felt the need to spell it out and handhold the audience for saying Hey, this is what we mean when we say she is leery about taking a job, you know, from a film producer. But I'm like, do we need all that extra? I, I mean, they, they completely they spell out that, hey, here, go be a stripper. Yeah. You're, you're a good looking girl. Go take your clothes off for money. Yeah. Well, I mean, but Mark, if we didn't have that opening, you know, montage of her doing the, the song and dance routine, how would we have understood her doing the song and dance routine on the edge of a cliff with King Kong for what seemed like 20 minutes? I swear yeah. to God, there was no need for any of that nonsense. 
Well, and, and that's the thing is, I, I agree with you there too, Ian, that, and Joe, I think you're in agreement as well. There's just a lot of extra. I mean, there's the scene where the guys are getting chased with the, instead of in the original where we had the crew facing a charging Stegosaurus, which worked perfectly fine, which I wouldn't have mind them replicating at all. Peter Jackson's going, no, remake. We've got bigger screens. We've got to do bigger, bigger, you know, bigger uh, uh, sequences. It's a, you know, a, 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 a whole herd of Brontosaurus being chased by raptors because damn it they rejected my application for jurassic park so fuck, <laughs> i'm gonna make jurassic park and so he makes jurassic park in this extendedly long brontosaurus chase scene that didn't need to be long yeah it's tension filled but then for the first few minutes but then you're just like and then it ends on a punchline basically of a the herd of brontosaurus piling on each other like in a looney tunes cartoon and that's where i was trying to figure out i'm like is is that supposed to be comical or are we supposed to be feeling dangerous because i'm laughing my ass off at a huge pile of brontosaurus <laughs> that trip over each other by the end of it we got a wilhelm you know? scream in there too uh huh? right yeah. as they were rounding the corner we got a wilhelm and then they we get a wilhelm around the corner <laughs> You know, and then and then you know, why are these raptors going after the humans when you've got the bigger brontosauruses? It's just like the, you know, I. Well, I don't know. I just it, it went too long. To huh? Well, it's probably easier to catch. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we'll have a harder time defending themselves against the raptors. True. True. The brontosaurus can whip them with yeah. the tail. But I mean, but I mean like that the, sequence the, went too long. <laughs> right. I mean, but you pointed uh, you pointed out too, Mark. Like the we've got all this money we can instead of the thing that annoyed the crap out of me is you not only have one t-rex but you've got kong fighting two t-rexes at the yeah. same time three and was it three I, it I was a third well it wasn't a t-rex but it was like a smaller t-rex ish creature he was fighting oh, okay. three creatures oh, that's right there's a third creature there yeah but he couldn't okay. use andero as a club unlike in king Godzilla X Kong, where King Kong literally used the little baby Kong as a club. It was beautiful. Anyway, go on. Uh, <laughs> really selling these movies on me, Mark. Um, no, uh, <laughs> but the thing is, Kong versus three CGI dinosaurs, uh, none of it is as entertaining, convincing, or memorable as Kong fighting the one T Rex in 1933 because it. it it looked like, and this is no <laughs> knock on the CG animators or, or anything like that, but yeah, I just, I could feel the work and the passion that went into making it look like these two Titans were fighting each other in the jungle with like this little lady hanging on by a tree that's uh, falling backwards. Uh, it, yeah, it's just, it's so cool that you really got to appreciate the movement and the nuance of the fighting. And I really was, was rooting for Kong against that T-Rex here. I was just like, like you like to do, Mark. I was looking at my my non-existent watch. Like, when the hell is this going to wrap up so we can move on? Well, well, and it goes to what Joe was saying and what you said earlier too. The sheer volume of points in this film where Andaro should have been a pancake. Let's not yeah. forget, Kong's not only fighting two to three reptiles at once; he's holding on to her the whole fucking time. I'm like, put her down. Dude, yeah, just, in the original movie, he does put her he in the tree while he fights the T-Rex. Yeah. And and that adds an element of danger because that, you know, she's precariously kind of placed there, and you wonder is something gonna come out of the, the jungle and get her too. Yeah, that's yeah. I'm, I mean, all it took was Kong f forgetting she was in his hand and you know, Mike Tysoning it up, and all of a sudden, boom, <laughs> now you know, instead of brass knuckles, you've got you know a mashed Daryl. You know, in, in your <laughs> strawberry jam all over your head. Now. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I, and I understand why Jackson did that, but that why was I don't understand <laughs> exactly <laughs> why it would have been just as easy if you would have put Anne on a ledge precariously and still had him fight the three dinosaurs. That's fine, but my mind kept going back to Anne Darrow in his hand every time. Going, is she? How is she? Yeah. I, you know, 
jumping back uh, ahead here, I kind of thematically, I admired the comedy and the cruelty at the end after Kong gets out of the, you know, gets loose on the city. Mm-hmm. And he just starts picking up blonde women and like looking at them, <laughs> and throwing them away. <laughs> and you can hear the crunch of the bones. Like the one lady that's supposed to be the Fay Ray yeah. and Darrow type that's on the uh, on, on the, the stage. stage. He picks her up and like he like <laughs> opening also- season opening season pitch into the <laughs> into the balcony. That was beautiful. But also the disgusted look <laughs> on Tom's face when he sees it's not Naomi Watts. <laughs> He he literally curls his nose up like someone <laughs> farted in the theater. He, he the minute she he's like, oh okay, hey, it's my girl. Hey, and then she looks up at him. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> like like she's like this hideous demon or something. And she's not, but he just she's is not like, a bad looking woman at all. But she's not good enough for King Kong. <laughs> just like. <"Ugh." laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was that was a part that made me that made me laugh so hard the last time, and like we, because he pulls the woman out of bed and he sees it's not fair, and he just chucks her, and he does that like fifteen times in this one. <laughs> like, yeah. no, cool. <laughs> all these women are dead just because they were, they were <laughs> not <Dr. Juan>. <laughs> All these poor women. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did like it. I liked his. I liked his rampage in New York more you know I, I that felt i'm like okay uh i dug that and yeah it's just one of those things where i'm all i understand with these movies okay suspension of disbelief but there's suspension of disbelief and there's plot armor and then there's what you have in this film to where you're just like you're just like i'm sorry but i i you know, you get the fight multiple times when Anne should have been squashed you get multiple times when the the wonderful scene you it, we got the you mentioned it joe cuz you're a big fan of the first one we got the bug scene right Ian yeah. mentioned it. you you and it's horrifying but, <laughs> but then we get a scene where young jimmy has a gatling gun and he's sharp shooting guns off of adrian brody who is frantically running around through he doesn't even get like nicked they don't even do like the quit helping like in Hudson Hawk when you know she tries to shoot uh the butler and she ends up shooting Bruce Willis in the arm and he goes quit helping you don't even get one of those moments no Jimmy who doesn't who doesn't really hasn't held a gun before is like freaking you know dead eye on these bugs he's like pow pow with a Tommy gun which isn't the most accurate gun in the west anyway that's why you fire a lot of bullets because at law of averages, you're going to hit something with it. <laughs> yeah, that <clears throat> that was a bit. And, and the way they got out of that scene, I mean, like this after they squashed those uncircumcised worm monsters, whatever the hell they were, uh, plus the centipedes and this little crab guys. Then you see the spiders coming down out of the walls. <laughs> And you're like, how are they going to get out of this one? But they just seem to kind of like back out. But there, it seemed like they were backing into a place that for some reason didn't have spiders. And then the screenplay does a great cheat by having the captain show up with the entire rest of the crew and and, and shooting these creatures from, from above. Uh, yeah, the, the, I love that scene up until a point. Like when yeah. they're getting attacked and, and swarmed by these things, it's great. Like, uh, oh my gosh, why can't I think of his name? Andy Circus, yeah, uh, as the chef, as the cook, like when he gets eaten, and you know his face is inside this worm thing, and you can still hear him screaming, but it's just slightly muffled. It's like oh, so gruesome. And then you see the the other little spiky guys coming up and like <clears throat> kind of like poking at his at his belly and his back, like trying to figure out like where the soft spot is. They can really lunge and pierce him in. It's it's beautiful. I it's funny because. You mentioned the kind of the turn is like, oh, it's just this fun adventure movie until the guy gets the spear in the chest. Um, I started watching this movie actually on Saturday morning oh. and I watched the first like 40 minutes and my son came out. <clears throat> my youngest oh, came no. out and he was like, oh, it's King Kong. And I, I knew that it was mostly talking and people like getting to know each other on the ship. So I'm like, let me fast forward to a part where Kong fights something. And I did. And then he said he wanted to go back and watch the talky parts and my heart melted. Aww. But then we had to we had to pause the movie 
And when I went back today to resume, why did I say it like that? To resume the movie, <laughs> I, it, I realized how lucky I was that I cut it off when I did because I pressed play and one minute later, the guy oh. gets the spear through the chest. <laughs> <laughs> like, and then everything just gets like super violent and dark and grisly. I'm like, yeah, he would not have been able to watch any of that. Yeah, the tribe too. I I guess I like the way they were in the first one. It made more sense. Here we get zombie like yeah, that... it, well, what was that, Joe? I mean, I don't. I get don't it know. The- I I was I was watching this trying to figure it out. Like, what what were you going for exactly? Because they, they are they they're not like just regular natives. They seem to be doing. I I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Maybe they were like uh, they had like a combination of like ayahuasca and the rage virus from Twenty Eight Days Later. That seemed to be what was going on there. Well, I mean, they literally they walk up because they go into the village, and you think they're going to play a different <laughs> angle in here. They're like they go into this village, you're like, oh, okay, this time around with the remake, village is empty, and there's going to be some other way that we get and Darrow connected with Kong, which I would have been kind of interested to see where they go. You know, you find this village been wiped out. Maybe it was wiped out by Kong. Okay. But they come up until they come across this little girl whose eyes are all rolled in the back of her head. She's standing there all a la ring, you know, to the, even to the point of she puts her hand out and her hand twitches a little. It does that. <laughs> sound just like from the ring. I'm like, what? Okay, maybe we're dealing with kind of a I no, this is just the way these folks are. I'm like, are you trying to get around native portrayal of a native culture? Maybe so that you don't get possibly into controversial territory for incorrect portrayal. So you just make them a voodoo zombie tribe. Yeah, <laughs> which is like- which is much better. Much more sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> Which just, they just come off as even more savage. I mean, this this group, folks, this group of individuals who live on Kong, I- Kong Island would have the cannibals from Green Inferno going, yeah, no, we're good. We're- I thought about the Green you Inferno <laughs> tribe when I was watching this. I'm like, oh, shit. It's Eli Roth needed to direct this scene. I, I think that would have been, <laughs> he would have gotten it just right. Then hand it back over to Peter when he was done. <laughs> yes, yeah, something something felt really off with it, and I, I it felt like that early two thousands like like ghosts you'd see in movies around that time, mm-hmm. where like to make them look creepier, you'd cut you'd cut like a little snippet out of out of the film to make it look like they're like jumping and you know like 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 they're moving like in a supernatural way because it kind of felt like that at times, and I and I was like, why? It's it's combined it, like. You didn't need to make them that way, <laughs> like, they, because they, they don't exist outside of this one little sequence. So, well, and also it was this is the part where I don't know if he took it beyond this scene. I think he might have like once or twice, but you get that freak out vision that I think Ann Darrow has a couple of times yeah. when you know, her point of view and she's like seeing the skulls and the bones mm-hmm. laid out. And it's like, whoa, it's kind of like fuzzy on the edges in slow motion, but you got the weird distorted sound. They do that a lot uh, in, in this movie during that sequence. And I was like, I get it. It's, it's not effective anymore. Well, uh, you know, and I understand they wanted to make Skull Island more of a threat with the boat, but I think like a lot of things in this film, it was extra fat that wasn't needed. You know, I you've made Skull Island dangerous enough. You don't have to make it impossible to get onto the, you know, it can't just be an island. No, no, we have to have this huge set of rocks the ships pressed up against it, it just it was like they put well like you you used the word perfectly ian the superfluous there's a lot of stuff in here that just seemed to be put in there just for the sake of putting it in there let's be different but at the same time like you don't necessarily have to you could have stuck with what worked you know i mean let's face it the the Nate, the tribe scene in the original, and I'm not saying this just because I enjoyed the original 
more than this one. I did find parts to really enjoy in 2005. I didn't hate it by any means, but the tribe there, I liked them, and I thought they were actually felt more threatening than this tribe just because they were like, hey, I'll give you six of my wives for the blonde, you know, and they were at least developed a little bit more than, you know, what we got here. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. And they felt more realistic. I mean, they had the, the kind of the rituals where they're dancing around in the giant, you know, the, the ape costumes. But it was very simple. They had one wall with this one door and they had the one bar coming across it. We meet this tribe. It looks like they've they're they're living on the other side of Mountain Doom. There's like fucking lava flowing, <laughs> and there's also rain and these elaborate doors and sit, like th no, this does not exist. This is pushing the realm of fantasy a little bit too far. And I think if they had just stuck with what they did in thirty three, you're right. The the negotiation between the tribes, the fact that they ended up kind of working together when they're trying to you know keep Kong out. Uh, you know, it's it's really yeah. He, there was it was a big step backwards i think yeah i feel like in an effort to make them scarier you dehumanize them to such a degree that they became like a self-parody yeah. yeah yeah well and again no i i don't look for logic in my kaiju films i'm fully aware i enjoy the legendary films thank you ian i i understand okay <laughs> but when it comes to a tribe that has a trough around their village that you would have to have kong jump in order to get at never mind you have flowing lava coming out of your walls and huge flames coming out yet you feel the need to sacrifice you know i feel like there was some other motivation for the sacrifices because in the original the sacrifice really felt like one of those situations where we got to offer up someone every so often to our god kong or he's going to come into our village and annihilate us here i'm like He's not going to come into your village because you got freaking lava coming out the door and flames. So if you hear him coming by, which he's not a guy who's just going to creep up on you, <laughs> boom, you know, launch the lava. And there you go. Why did they need to do the sacrifice? And I think that's just because it's a flaw in the the in the script and that they don't establish anything. At least in the first one, you had some guy kind of making deductions about the tribe even though they didn't understand the language they were making some deductions about their culture the society oh this is be you know you get the one guy's going oh it looks like they're you don't get any of that here you just get feral zombie like tribe who are <clears throat> sacrificing her for you don't even get a guy reasons don't, they don't tell us i would have even liked a guy and i don't much you don't need much disposition just a guy who who may have been around the ocean enough and going oh i've seen this ritual they're going to try to sacrifice her because they think it's going to give her long life even a line like that just just one line because they're so well, zombie if they, if they sacrifice her then she's not going to have a long life though no no them they would their oh, tribe, okay, that makes more sense you know sorry for them to sacrifice one person to give them their tribe the long life even just have a guy drop a line like that in this film it would at least explain the fantasy angle side of going oh maybe that is actually working because look at the way they are they've these guys may have been around for a long time doing this but instead we don't get that we just get them in this very fortified town uh <laughs> you know right. but i mean to that whole thing that you said was was good. I mean, they, they could have helped out the audience, but they could have helped them out even more by just simplifying everything to what we've been mm -hmm. talking about. Just remake the original. Don't change anything except the technology with which you make the movie. And I think it's... It, well, in that scenario, I think it could have potentially stood side by side instead of just being like, oh, it's a remake of the original. And you know, when when you messaged us as you were leaving because you had to go to a, to, to another event or something, yeah. whatever it was, you said, why the hell does this movie have to be twice 
the length of the original. And I feel like you just kind of answered that because it's they for some reason I feel like they look at these older movies as just you know, oh they're quaint and cute, but we are going to make them better by making them bigger and making everything bigger. And King Kong's going to fight two T Rexes and they're going to be chased by a stampede of Stegosauruses yeah, yeah. because. Like, and like you said, why why couldn't you just remake the same simple story with just the better technology? Well, even if... Well, you, oh, go ahead, Ian. I was going to say, even from a ticket sales standpoint, if you want, you know, you can get more showings with yeah. a, a lean hour and a half movie rather than, oh my God, three and a half hours to go see King Kong back in 2000. Three hours and ten minutes. Yeah. You know, and I, my, 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 room, my roommate always laughs when I, when I go, oh, fuck, this movie's over two hours. It's, it's two hours and seven minutes. You got to figure the credits are going to be like 10 minutes because it's full of effects. Okay, granted. Like, the, the three hours? <laughs> like you, you cut out the 10 minute credits, you're still looking at a three hour movie here. Yeah. It's yeah. a big chunk of the day. And, a lot, and like you guys have been saying, a lot of it's kind of filler. Not, not all of it's bad. And, I, and no. I don't by any means want to say that this is a terrible movie. And I definitely see a lot worse, but. I think it'd be it'd be fun, and maybe someone's done it because it's been almost twenty years. But it'd be cool to just do a fan edit remake of the Thirty Three King Kong using the footage that they re you know recreated in this version. You add in the spider nest scene or whatever. But I mean, I'm I, aside from a couple of character changes, like we mentioned with the the Jack Driscoll and the, the Bruce Baxter character, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the actor differences, but I think you could make an hour and 33 or, you know, 38 minute. If you had the spider scene version of 33 using the 2005 footage, I would love well, to see that. I mean, even if you want to go to two hours and include and try to, which is what this film does. First one Kong is pretty much, a monster and he is a monster until he meets you know and darrow and we have that here but it they expand upon that connection to where and unlike the first one and here is not afraid you know she does it she develops a, a unfear and a bond with Kong. you could even do that and that would be your angle to do a remake where you get most of the same of the film until you get the scenes with Anne and Kong by themselves. And then you develop that, maybe that stronger connection and the humanize your Kong a little bit more and the relationship with Anne. And you could still do the rest of the film and just add those scenes. Cause I loved that bit. I love the, I, I actually love the bit of the development of the relationship, even though we were joking earlier at the podcast of, Oh, this isn't going to work. I still think it's an interesting take with a monster film like this to where they, develop this relationship of bond where he's almost like her cat of sorts her <laughs> her pet you know a, you know that that type of, that ty that type of you know admiration type feeling towards this this being that she knows you know this is <laughs> he's ridiculous but i like that angle so you could literally do the scenes you had from the first film keep the characters fairly the same and then just add those parts where it's connected there. And I think you got a solid two hour film right there that shows a justification for a remake in that you develop and change things with the Darrow character and relationship with Kong to where she's not just scared and screaming all the time. And yet you still trim it down to keep it moving rather than mm -hmm. all the excess to one, some point going, okay, this is just more overblown action sequences because you're like, we got $80 million left in the budget. Let's go. <laughs> felt like that at times. It felt like we're doing this because we can, not because it serves the story. So that's yeah, I mean, even even the 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 airplane, you know, assaults oh, yeah. on the Empire State Building at the end, like that went on way too long, and you know, there there are way too many wide shots where you could see the planes like swooping around like all of New York. And it just it dim diminishes the impact of Kong, this giant creature on top of a giant building, because you see him too often and he's very small. He's like, that's not that impressive. Whereas in 33, he's more the proportions might be the same, but I feel like there's we get more close ups and more sort of medium shots of him swiping at these planes and not so much like, probably because they couldn't shoot a lot of they, they couldn't recreate all of New York for these planes to fly over yeah. and, and through um so yeah it's just another loss 
it's it's weird his size varies on plot or on so- seeing it because at some parts he seems almost as large as the original and in other scenes it seems like he's more like mighty joe young type size <laughs> you know at parts and so that was a little inconsistent because i get what they were trying to go for with three bake well if he was this size and this is the empire state building he wouldn't be as foreboding as you see in the 33 on the other hand that's what makes him seem because when he's on the empire state building his feet can barely hold on to the top of the empire state building (laughs) in the original and here he's got a flat like tennis court to play on you know (laughs) uh but in any case um i think we'll wrap it up here uh but it's not a bad film i didn't hate the film yeah I don't, it's I, just, I it just goes too long. It really does. It, yeah, it feels bloated, which I, I think most people could agree with that. Uh, the, the other one's only, what, an hour 45? About that. If that, that yeah. So, you know, the original is, is nice and lean. Um, I, I, I also, I mean, I mean, this could just be nostalgia. I kind of like the look of King Kong better in the original one. Also, it was something about the face that was so much more, uh, more articulate. Maybe, maybe it's just me romanticizing it because you know I, I'm watching it when I'm ten years old. You know, I, I, the, the the new one, it's okay. It just looks like a giant gorilla, which maybe is what it was meant to be. But well, yeah, I mean the the, the Kong from the original film looked like a giant. Ape, but also not because he had the, these impossible, like crazy fangs and teeth that jutted out everywhere. These big, kind of cartoonish, expressive eyes. Whereas right now, you've got oh, it's a photorealistic giant, you know, ape. Yeah, it feels like it's not impressive, as- but it doesn't have as much personality. Yeah, it doesn't feel as 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 interesting. Yeah. Well, that that's why I mentioned Mighty Joe Young because that's basically what that what you know that was just a big oversized gig- gigantic ape and this one felt more like that versus a kong creature because he he walks around on all fours for most of it too he's not walking up right which we got more of with the original kong yeah that's you right. know he he's walking around more on all fours like a regular gorilla and i get what they're trying to go for but i'm like kong was developed enough to where he usually walked around on his back legs not on all four even though he was a gorilla or you know developed from a gorilla and in here i think that's another thing that takes a bit away from him in that making him oh he's just a big ape (laughs) (laughs) i've never seen the remake of mighty joe young though was that any good or it was all right i've seen it once but i'm I'm um, actually amazed at that oh actually no i shouldn't say that got remade first because there was a 70s remake of king kong which it's kind of the forgotten one um we we talked about that that on our podcast many a uh, number of years ago, and there's a reason why that's the forgotten one. <laughs> yeah, that's how I was watching it. I was like, oh, okay, this is not very good. <laughs> I, I hard disagree there. I really like the the '76 version. No, um, there's entertainment value there, there, but I, I, I'm just saying that the consensus at large of why it's it's lost is because you know it just was not well <laughs> received. How, how do you think you know. it, it, it seems you like it better than either of us? How do you feel it compares to either one? Uh, what, where would I rank it? Like um, if you were to rank the three of them. Yeah, Kong 33, Kong 76, and Kong 2005. Oh, okay. so uh, like yeah. Because okay. it's mm-hmm. still a leaner, it's still a leaner film, still hits all those That's notes. That's true too. That yeah, yeah and I think I think band. I like I like Jessica Lang. I like the uh, the New York stuff. Um, I think part of it's just it's surreal seeing the, the the Twin Towers still as being like the the big like focal point of of that action. Um, oh, that was the other kind of too cute by half thing in this movie is they show it in the beginning and then at the end of New York the um, the support beams for the uh, L or the the, mm-hmm. the train system in New York. Yeah. Uh, they have this kind of like cross lattice work and they paint it so that uh, the crosses uh, you should, you see a K They're just K's 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 all the way up. Uh, Kong get it. It's Kong and it sticks out like a damn sore thumb. I'm like, just <laughs> stop Peter Jackson. Stop. That was, I knew I was in trouble within five minutes of this movie opening. You say that there's the, the 76 Kong is the only one that was made when the twin towers were around because 
they weren't up yet in 33 and they were gone by 05. Yeah. So yeah, that's the true that's, time capsule. Yeah. It is. Yeah, it really time. is. As what as is the teaser original teaser trailer for Spider Man. Uh so <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh yeah, because that came it out was, a couple months after 9-11. It Kate they they yeah, it was where he right. set up a web between the two towers to capture a helicopter and they pulled that teaser and and cut that out when <laughs> 9-11 happened because the it was too much of a trigger for many people. So. I totally get it. I was literally there when it happened. And yeah. yeah I, I probably would have freaked out in the theater if I saw that too. Yeah. So no freakouts here, I think, with Kong 2005. Uh I I think it's a better received film. And it, it's got a, a lot of love now over the years, it looks like the ratings are fairly high now versus when it first came out. I don't think it was as well received. I I thought it was bloated, and I still think it is. And I, 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 I just don't care for Jack, Jack Black in it. And I don't know what it is about his performance. And again, maybe it's subconscious from previous comedic work that I just kept. Maybe if I had not seen anything from Jack Black and this was the first time I saw him, I wouldn't take it as much. But he is so recognizable in his comedies that it just came off like that for me so well i think that's that's what i was responding to is because when i saw him even the first time we see him in that screening room i'm like wow he is restrained Mm -hmm. i mean he's being a little bit silly where he's like quick give me that glass so we can like listen to the conversation on the other side of the wall but he is not playing jack black in this movie Mm -hmm. he looks like jack black and he's got the kind of the arched eyebrows thing but if you Pay attention to those early 2000s comedies because he was sort of the it girl of it guys. Uh, he's, he's really doing something different in this movie. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll just agree to disagree to Jack Black. <laughs> but I just, I, that's the thing is, I don't no, know. I, 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 we agree on Jack Black. Yeah. We just disagree on how much Jack Black there is in this. Jack oh, that's Black. true. I, and I'm, I'm and I'm I'm trying to figure out how much of that was the was the performance versus what the screenplay originally right went for. like i that's the part where i'm like i don't know if he if was it, meant to be played for laughs versus that's just jack black that's just who he is they they either let jack black you know add jack black to it or if you're you're <laughs> right or or if if it, not as much as ian said and not as much but add more than maybe what was on paper or maybe that is how it was on paper and and that's what they told them to play it up to Oh. It feels yeah. It feels like this part was was written for him, uh, a for what he could bring to the role, and certainly the marquee, but also to give him the chance to stretch. Mm-hmm. Um, it felt like the Jackson and uh, his collaborators saw something that they're like, yeah, well, he can experiment. I, it, I'm reminded, not to the same degree, but I watched uh, Batman '89 over the weekend. And there was, you know, Michael Keaton got a lot of shit, or mm-hmm. I should say Warner Brothers, because you're going to cast Mr. Mom as the Dark Knight. And yeah, there's a lot of Michael Keaton in that Bruce Wayne, but right. it is a restrained version. You mm-hmm. can see, well, I, I Heath Ledger, another example for, for the Joker. Like, why, why, why would you cast the, the, the pretty boy leading guy mm-hmm. uh, as the Joker, Mr. Knight's Tale? Yeah. Now there's something in there, somebody, something... Somebody saw something and they decided to take a gamble. I think it paid off. By the way, not to take us off course again, but you mentioned fan edits before. Have you seen the fan edit of the 89 Batman turning it into a silent film using only the score and kind of making the uh, the color monochrome? No. I watched like the first 10 minutes last night. It's actually it, – so far it looked really, really good. I'm going to go back and watch it. Oh, um, I'll find the link and, and message it to you guys. I yes. Guess, yeah. yes. I can't please. remember what it's called off the top of my head, but I'm going to go look at my history yeah. and send it to you. And, All right. And, but and I know was, I – it was pretty cool. That does sound cool. And I know I said we'd wrap it up, but I just got to give a uh, uh, honorable mention to Kyle Chandler as Bruce Baxter in this. I I like this character. We don't get a lot of him, but he I, I enjoyed him quite a bit because you get this. He get he gets his moment to where uh, they, someone calls him out for trying to be a hero, and he's like. I'm not a hero. I'm an actor. He's like, do you see who heroes are? He's like, they're not me. I'm an actor. <laughs> and 
I wonder if that was a take on Warner Baxter, who was the who was an actor who was in a lot of adventure films in the early thirties. Mm-hmm. Well, wasn't in King Kong, but maybe no. But uh, here's here's how you here's how you make the Carl Denham in this movie perfect. Mm-hmm. You have him get squashed by King Kong at the very end of the movie, and then you have Bruce Baxter come in and say, you know, Carl yeah. Denham really believed in making movies, and we're going to donate the we're going to make sure that the, <laughs> the proceeds from this disastrous benefit go to his family. And there's your rule of three. There you go. There's your rule of three. And if you want. Uh, inside reference uh, watch man bites dog the the unedited version and you get a similar thing a gimmick with the director as his crew one by one gets killed because of the documentary have either one of you seen man bites dog uh i saw it a couple years ago the the french film right yeah the french doc the french mockumentary one of the first yeah i I saw it a couple years ago but yeah it's dark, but it's hilarious. And they've got this gimmick because, uh, not to go too long here, but the gimmick with Man Bites Dog is it's a mockumentary of this film crew who goes and actually documents a day in the life of a serial killer, a French serial killer, this guy, who's been doing this for some time. He's agreed. So this is this is like uh, uh, behind the mask of Leslie, the rise of Leslie Vernon. It's but pre that. But it's in the same vein, except you don't get cutaways of like the actual horsey that you just get these guys following this guy as he like breaks into a home and kills the entire family, including a kid. Uh, he shows how he kills an old lady by just scaring her and then taking her social security check. <laughs> I mean, it's completely black comedy and if you watch the unedited version there's some really extreme scenes but one of the gimmicks is one of the crew members of the documentary uh keep getting killed and so then you get the director talking to the camera going uh he was a really great talent uh my heart goes out to his wife and kids you know <laughs> and it's, that's what reminded me long story short too late uh they reminded me here of this was the same thing of oh we'll donate the money to the wife and kids and you're right it needed that one third time to really like and maybe somebody cuts him off and tells him to shut up. Right. Yeah. Like, right. Dude, <laughs> before he finishes it. Yeah. Just like, no, don't. Just, yeah, <laughs> bro, we're getting killed. I, I, my wife and kids would rather have me. <laughs> uh, it's on the Internet Archive, by the way, the Batman. Uh, it's called Batman, the silent motion picture. It is on the Internet Archive. Cool. Uh, it, they, they just take the um, the Danny Elfman score and just kind of mm-hmm. use oh, that well. route. I'm there. I'm there. Yeah, I saw the first it. few minutes of it last night. I'm going to watch it at some point. It, yeah. it looked really interesting, and Burton's Burton style lends itself to to doing yeah. that kind of thing. So, oh yeah, oh yeah. And before uh, we get our audience to leave us and my listeners to just cut us off because we're almost half the runtime of this movie, uh, <laughs> yeah. we're going to have to end it for the night. So I hope you all enjoyed this conversation very much uh it's an interesting beast no pun intended king kong 2005 uh there's a really enjoyable movie in here that versus the okay movie we get uh it's just all the extra fat needed to be really trimmed or tidied quite a bit so now as always this is where i give my lovely crew members a chance to license to show so ian you're first tonight sir license to show floor is yours I'm Ian Simmons. I run Kicking the Seat, which you can find at kickseat.com and also on YouTube if you look up Kicking the Seat. Um, Movie reviews, interviews, uh, roundtables, all sorts of fun stuff. I've got uh, an interview with a a Swiss director named Laurent Negre that just went up for his uh, film called A Forgotten Man. That was very good. Um, And then this Wednesday, I'm going to be doing a roundtable review of uh, Civil War. Um, like to avoid controversy at all costs on my channel so uh yeah, yeah right. hang, hang out yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure and uh, joe go ahead sir oh uh, well i'm uh one of the co-hosts of the literary license podcast uh this coming friday we'll be recording uh the dark crystal and labyrinth that'll be uh our next uh uh, our next two for one uh, dark families and then uh, next week we're continuing going through anthology films and we're going to be doing uh, the house that drip blood and uh, um, asylum so uh, you can join us for those um, 
basically anywhere anywhere you listen to podcasts, we're, we're available there. Uh, also on YouTube. Um, so yeah, that's it for me. Cool, and I'll put links for their fine work. Uh, in the body of description of this podcast. And if you're at all interested in the other works that I do, go to specialmarkproductions.com. Uh, we have links there to all the little tidbits here and there uh, that I do. So uh, I thank you very much all folks uh, for listening to this. And next week, I believe it is uh, King Kong Escapes uh, is on the list. So I, uh, you? I have it right here. <laughs> <laughs> I have it right here. On this I've never list. seen it. So what the hell? Maybe I'll join you for it. And, and we'll finish up the conga line in two weeks with the uh, epic King Kong versus Godzilla. And if we can uh, do a, a comparison between the American version and the Japanese version, because that is always very interesting, especially with those two films. Uh, so until then, folks, uh, we all will just say uh, good night, everyone. Good He's pounding. Well, <laughs> there we go all chest pounds in there <laughs>